Good afternoon to you. Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. Now, believe it or not, it is March the 5th, 2018. Where has the time gone? I cannot believe that we're already into early March. And it has been a heck of a March already. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But first, let's take a look at the SOI going through our tropical segment here. This is the new site from the Queensland government and uh, the Bureau of Meteorology down in Australia. And they have rolled out their new site officially. So this is the SOI version page of the site. And the Southern Oscillation Index tells us <clears throat> a lot. Oh, the pollen's coming back. This is going to be a fun week. It tells us a lot about the pressure pattern across the tropical Pacific. And as we can see here, the last 30 days, it's been a little bit negative at minus 3.66. But the 90-day average is real close to zero. And these are not any kind of units, okay? These are not like a temperature unit in degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius or whatever. It's just an index. And it tells us, again, how the pressure pattern is. And what we're looking for are big departures from zero or normal, the average. Either strongly positive or strongly negative. Strongly positive typically represents the state of the atmosphere where we have an El Nino, uh, a La Nina when it's positive, and when it's strongly negative and persistently so, we typically get an El Nino. And it's hard to explain in this video without it getting ridiculously boring, but that's what I look for here. And so as we can see, the 90-day average hovering close to zero, and therefore we are leaning more towards and moving towards neutral conditions, and the daily contributor for what it's worth is 7.80 and I like this because we can go through and actually see the chart here there's uh, the graph of it uh, they've done a really good job with this uh, the 30 day and the 90 day you know maybe trying to converge at some point uh, big big drop of course in the 30 day you can see that right there that's the red line coming back up now but the 90 day has just been a steadier decline and not quite as steep and we can see the various daily readings through here between Tahiti and Darwin, and then you get the contributor based on the formula they have devised. And you can see we've been pretty positive for a while now after a very solid stretch of strongly negative for a while. And you can see that all through here, and then we rebounded and we've gone into positive again. So what does it all mean? Well, we'll get to that in just a moment because not only do you have the SOI in the Pacific, but you have the North Atlantic Oscillation and that involves pressure patterns across the North Atlantic. And for a good deal of this year, uh, really from about mid-December on until just recently, it's been positive. Anything above this line is a positive NAO. And that typically leads to a stronger high pressure way out in the Atlantic, in the Eastern Atlantic. Uh, it means a lot of things, but this is part of what we look at. And it generates stronger trade winds, and it cools off the tropical Atlantic. When you get blocking, what we call high-latitude blocking, and a negative NAO, it dives, the index <clears throat> dives, and this blocking takes place, and you get these big storms like we just saw, and like what's coming up, and also you slow down the trade winds across the Atlantic. So look what happened here in recent days. The, S, uh, the NAO, stuck on the SOI on the brain, took a negative dive and is staying negative for a while. And then some of the models here, these ensemble prediction, uh, you see the spread here, the plume, it's staying generally negative or maybe slightly positive through mid-March. So this is going to have some impact. So what does the SOI and the NAO, the NAO, the NAO all have to do with each other? Well, again, with the SOI, it helps to control... Uh, for the most part, what's going on over here with the state of the ENSO, or El Nino Southern Oscillation. And with a negative SOI, your pressures are going to be lower over here. This is just a generalization, okay? Higher in the Western Pacific. And so the net flow of air is going to generally be more to the east from the west. Now, this is an oversimplification of it. That helps to push warmer water from the Western Pacific warm pool and disrupt everything, slow the trade winds down, and you start to warm all of this up if it sustains itself, that negative SOI. So we'll watch that. Uh, and then the negative NAO helps to, again, thwart the trade winds down here a little bit, calms them down, 
And I can show you this. Remember, go back and look at the NAO. It was positive for a while. We saw strong trade winds across the tropics. We saw some tweets from uh, Phil Klotzbach talking about uh, the North Atlantic has cooled rather dramatically uh, since December. And we can see that. But we can also see, as I told you last week, when this went negative, this is what it looks like now. And the NAO went negative, and this is what it looked like last week. So look at that difference. It's subtle, but it's there. Look right through here. Okay, this is last week, and here's this week. What do you notice? It's starting to warm back up just a little bit. It's going to take time. It's not going to be very dramatic. What is dramatic, in my opinion, is uh, the Gulf of Mexico here is really warmed up uh, compared to the uh, norm. This is last week. Here it is this week. Yeah, I mean, even in the Gulf, we have certainly added some heat content there overall. But the eastern Atlantic starting to warm up just a little bit again, and that will probably continue as long as the NAO stays negative and you don't have this really strong high pressure sitting out here blasting the trade winds across the main development region. And we are within 90 days of the Atlantic hurricane season starting, and so this will start to matter. That's not that far out into the future, folks, okay? At the end of May, into June, and even the eastern Pacific, that season begins May the 15th. So we're getting closer, and so things like this are really going to start to matter more and more uh, as we go forward, not just something to watch to keep us occupied during the off-season. All right, spring breakers, I know that my college kids, I've got two of them, uh, their spring break is starting this week. They are not heading to the Gulf Coast. They have other plans. But for those of you who are, your shelf water areas are warming up. Still a little chilly for my taste. But notice, again, this large area of 26 Celsius isotherm uh, really expanding into the southeast Gulf well ahead of schedule. And even the southeastern part of the Bay of Campeche over here uh, warming up. And now that we are into March, this is not going to reverse. And... Here we go. You know, this is the march towards, to use a pun here, so to speak, uh, the start of the hurricane season when we get inside that 90-day period. Looking at the Atlantic, and remember, these are actual sea surface temperatures, not departures or anomalies. Okay, These are actual sea surface temperatures. And off the East Coast, still very, very chilly off the Mid-Atlantic and New England. I saw that firsthand up here in Massachusetts. Uh, that strong north-northeast wind coming off the Atlantic, you know, it was steadily in the 40s, upper 30s to 40s because of that cold ocean water. And some of these temperatures in here, 5 degrees Celsius and even a few 4 degrees Celsius pockets in there. And uh, very cold shelf water, as you would imagine. But farther to the south, 25 degrees Celsius, the, the Gulf Stream down here. And you notice, too, that the gradient... The gradient, the, uh, the separation of temperatures, the difference over distance is not as strong. We don't see this crazy solid black line in here where you have um, very, very warm water temperatures here butting up against ridiculously cold water temperatures over here. And we can see that. These are the actual temperatures. Again, here are the anomalies. And there you go. Everything in the northwest Atlantic well above the long-term average. All right, so that's important for nor'easters that we're getting and then in the upcoming hurricane season, but really that's for August and September. But as long as these hold, and they've, this has been here for several years, so it's an interesting pattern repeating itself again and again and again. We'll just have to see how much of a mirror it actually is. You're never going to have the exact same thing, obviously, too much chaos in the whole mix, but this is interesting to note. All right, so leaving the tropics and looking at lower 48 weather, uh, storm system coming down out of the Great Plains here. Energy is going to come in off the uh, coast and then form another nor'easter. You know, I don't know if that's the exact track it'll take, but your classic nor'easter getting ready to set up again. So you folks up here in New England and parts of the mid-Atlantic, even down to Jersey and Delaware, Maryland, Get ready. Wind, tides, not going to be as bad on the tide side. We'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. But a lot of snow coming for somebody this time. There was a lot of snow for people last time, but even more so, uh, even more so snow coming. Sounds like Dr. Seuss uh, this time around as well. So this energy dropping out of the plains will sweep around, and I'll show you that 
on the uh, GFS here from Levi Cowan's website. Tropical tidbits, great visualization of that energy. There it is right there. This is the powerful storm. Weather Channel named it Riley. You know what? I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, and I'm not biased because I do sometimes work with the Weather Channel. When they first started naming storms several years ago, I thought it was silly. I wrote a blog about it, talking about how much I respected the Weather Channel as a kid, and I thought the naming of winter storms was a bad idea. But as I've seen these big, big storms, and then really noticing how in Europe they're naming them, and they have done that for a while, it's not named by any corporation. It's, you know, I guess it's a, an official government thing. Maybe it's not such a bad idea because, honestly, there are databases, scientific research that's being done, and if you have all these, well, it was the January Nor'easter, and then it was the March Nor'easter. Well, no, it was the March 1st Nor'easter, and then there was a March 7th Nor'easter, then there was a March 14th Nor'easter. That gets crazy. So I don't know if you have to name them names like Mike or Riley or you know, whatever, maybe, I don't know, but some kind of a naming system may not be a bad idea on an official level. And some people are going to you know, disagree with that strongly, and that's fine. I'm just saying maybe it's not a bad idea, especially to help with future, I mean, we, we eventually named them in the past, right? The Ash Wednesday Storm, the Superstorm of 1993, and those are all very hyperbolic names as well, right? They have this sort of inflated whatever about them, and so naming them Winter Storm Riley, eh, it's not such a bad thing in my opinion. All right, so there it is, the March 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th Winter Storm, because it's still out there. It's still stuck in the Western Atlantic. And look at those isobars still on that thing. Let's single out the uh, image here. I just want to show you the startup uh, picture the initial shot here. Look at all those isobars, still very windy. Well, I won't say very windy, but it's windy enough out in eastern Massachusetts. And, you know, the effects from this storm reached all the way down us off the map here to the northern Caribbean with incredible waves, uh, even some damage in Puerto Rico and the north <clears throat> facing beaches. There was overwash even here in the Outer Banks of North Carolina directly related to this storm system. So you bet maybe naming these powerhouse ones when they reach a certain threshold isn't such a bad idea. All right, enough of that. So here's this energy. It'll come down. Let's go back to the uh, animation version of this, and I will show you how this progresses over the next few days. All right, so here's the initial map roughly. So watch how this comes to fruition. The energy comes off the North Carolina coast and uh, the Delmarva region, and... The upper level energy is lagging behind. You know, you can sort of see that if you know how to read these maps. But as you progress, look at that. You know, 994, that's not too bad. Uh, 990, it looks like some pretty stiff wind, heavy snow uh, comes up not too far off the, what they call the benchmark, the 4070 benchmark. Eastern Massachusetts. Now, this is a problem. And I'm going to single out this image. All right, so don't worry about the big time surge and tides this time around. Yes, there will be some beach erosion and some problems, but we're going into astronomical low tide, so that's going to mitigate this a lot. What I'm worried about is right there. See all that yellow? That's very, very heavy rainfall in areas that have already had saturated ground, already close to flood levels. So again, you got to look at these impacts and understand the bigger picture. You see all the blues, a lot of snow, darker blues or heavier snow. People focus on the snow, the blizzard part of it, much like they do with the wind aspect of hurricanes and lose sight of the rest of the picture. So in this case, coastal flooding, some areas, yes. Very heavy rain, big problem, especially for some of these basins that have had too much. And then very, very heavy snow for somebody. It's just hard to say exactly who uh, at this point, but it's coming. All right, so let's look at that again. There it is off the coast. And this is Wednesday night into Thursday, and it lingers up right off the coast of Massachusetts into the Gulf of Maine. Uh, you know, if you like skiing on into the spring, this is a great storm for you. But if you're sick of this weather already, this is a big problem. And then, I hate to tell you, I'm just the messenger, but another one comes off, and this one could be a beast. It starts off farther to the south, snow perhaps in the Appalachians, and this thing cranks up, we're talking about 
about a week out, okay, right off of Hatteras, and the pattern still stuck in that negative NAO, and so that means that there's pretty strong blocking, like way over here. So these can't just zoop, zoop out to sea. Is that a word? It's a combination of zoom and something else. They scoot, maybe. They cannot just go out to sea quickly, all right, in a progressive pattern. They kind of get stuck over here, waiting, and then they go out. Or in the case of this last one, you know, the March 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, it came up and dilly-dallied around, and it's still sitting out there. So a week from now, we're going to be talking about another one. And it has the potential. Look at all those isobars in there. You get that closer to the coast over here. And at this point in time, we'll be getting towards a new moon. All right? And that's also an astronomical high tide. This could be a big problem. Just to kind of you know, show you what other people are saying, uh, Eric Fisher, fantastic meteorologist up in Boston. You know, this is the GFS ensemble forecast system. So the ski country area, absolutely going to get crushed. The coast, hard to say in terms of the snow, etc. And this just shows you uh, the uncertainty here. But this is pretty tightly clustered overall, pretty close to the Massachusetts coastline. So the immediate coast, maybe Boston, uh, Providence, that's going to be a tough one. But east of there, I think it's going to be all rain. We'll see. You know, but Boston down to Providence and points west, you could get a bunch of snow out of this. And if you got problems with trees that were just about to go over, and you get any wind, this could be another big power outage, all right? So please be prepared and think about that. So I went up to Massachusetts. I've always wanted to place something in Situate. I've seen the dramatic footage from storms of the past, and I didn't want to have exactly what everybody else had. And, you know, for this storm and storms of the past, where it's the, uh, you know, the waterfront, you see the waves hitting the seawall, it's extremely dramatic, and I mean, you see that all the way back to the 30s with some of these hurricanes way back then, and through modern times with HD video and whatever. I wanted to show what does it do on the other side. So in this video that I'm going to show you, uh, this is Oceanside Drive in Situate, and the lighthouse is like way down here, uh, about a mile away, can't see it. And then all the video that you saw where Cantori was and some of the video on the Weather Channel where the big waves were crashing along these houses in that curvature up there, this is the other side of that. You understand that? So somebody uh, was sitting way down here in a truck filming all that and the ocean waves hitting on this side. I wanted to put something on the other side to show you what the results were. And by goodness, if it didn't work, it was freaking phenomenal. So here's a clip. Let me just show you. Uh, it really shows you what happens here. So these are those waves crashing over. You can see that. And then it spills off of the decks. The water floods in. And look at that. I mean, it's really hauling it there. Basements are flooding. It's going downhill. This is all filling up with water. Every one of these overwash events adds to the overall water behind all these homes in Situate Harbor and elsewhere up and down the Massachusetts coast. I wish I had like a, a dozen of these cameras I could have put out. Manpower, funding, and time <laughs> notwithstanding, that's, that's hard to do. But this is really, really neat. It worked fantastic. The time lapse of it, I mean, I can even just scroll around on this and just kind of show you a time lapse of how things evolve. Look at all those overwatch. Hey, look, there's the National Guard. Da -da -da, very good. Here he comes. I was. I remember I saw this live when it happened, and I thought, man, what if a huge rogue wave hit right as that truck came by? You don't wish that on anybody, of course, but wouldn't that have just been incredible timing? That's a pretty big truck, though. It would have taken about a 70-foot wave, probably, and luckily we didn't have anything like that. But look at this. This is really fascinating, and I'm not putting down or whatever what the storm chasers capture because their video is very interesting and valuable and has a lot of eye candy potential for television, but this shows me a lot more. I can look at the process of the erosion, the deposition of rocks and sand. I'll be going through this video for a long time to come because it's very helpful uh, from the process point of view, not just 
hey, look at that amazing video. But like I said, it is amazing. And there's room for the, you know, the, I don't know what, the, the storm chasers. You know, they go up, they shoot the video, and they get that good money shot. I really like to add the science part of it. And the video can be science. It really can. You can extract science from video. I've said that for my entire career, and I stand by it. So there you go. That's just a little snippet. Speaking of snippets, a lot of people asking, where's the 2017 documentary? All right. You know, this is a delay. I was, had to go up to the Northeast. I'm almost done. So I have a dilemma here. And I want you to, uh, I see a lot of gamers talk about this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. I could do it in two parts because part one, so to speak, is ready. All I have to do is render it out, get it ready, put it on YouTube, and there it is. Part one would cover all the way up through Hurricane Harvey, right? Yeah, all of the preseason stuff, and, you know, it's, I get lengthy with these things. I don't just throw a highlight reel on there. So all the way up through Harvey would be part one, and I could put that out like Wednesday, and then it would give me a couple of weeks to finish up what I'm doing now because i got a couple conferences coming. I want to have everything done, but it's not ready yet. And then I would put part two out uh, within the next ten days, and that would cover Irma and Maria and Nate, uh, I do believe. Right? I think so. Or maybe I'd go through Irma on part one and then... Maria and Nate on part two. I'll think about it. But the bottom line, what's your vote? Put part one out, you know, so, like they do with some of these movies. You know, remember Lord of the Rings, well, it had to be because it was three books. But The Hobbit, they broke it up into three distinct movies. I'm not talking about three years making you wait, but, you know, you get the, the, the gist here. Maybe put it out in two parts. Uh, what do you think? Let me know. Do you want to wait for the whole thing, which is going to be over two hours long, or break it up into two parts, with part one coming out Wednesday and part two, you know, within the next ten days or so. Let me know in the comments section, would you? I'd appreciate it. All right, that's it for me for today. This was a long one, but we had a lot to go over, and uh, it's good to be back in North Carolina. I will not be going up there for this next storm, by the way. The coastal impact's not going to be as, as heightened, and so there's really not much role for me to do. Uh, anybody can film and take pictures of snow. You can have it. I'll wait to see what this next one does, which has the potential to be a beast and maybe even affect North Carolina as well. We'll see. All right, so I'm going to stay put. Have a good rest of your Monday. Again, let me know in the comments about what you want me to do. Put the whole thing out when it's done or put it out in two parts. Let me know. I'm Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, we'll talk again either later in the week as we decide what we do with the video or certainly sometime next week.